Hello friends. Welcome to our channel. Today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of the Harvey family. On that Sunday afternoon in January 2006, a man and his daughter visited his friend's family home for a New Year's gathering. He found the open door, a usual party thing. Entering, he saw thick smoke, alerted others, and called the authorities. Firefighters arrived, put out the fire, but tragically found the Harvey's lifeless bodies. What seemed like a fire turned into a murder investigation, leaving the investigators both shaken and perplexed. 49-year-old Brian Tabba Harvey, a local icon, gained recognition in the 1980s as the singer-songwriter for the underground indie band House of Freaks. Despite parting ways professionally with his musical partner, Johnny Hot, in the 90s, they remained close friends. Brian, a devoted musician, took the stage for the last time at a New Year's Eve show, which was sadly and unbeknownst to him, the final night of his life. On the other hand, 39-year-old Catherine Elizabeth Grabinski achieved success as the co-owner of the popular toy store World of Mirth, located in Richmond's Carytown district. A community pillar, she was an artist involved in various endeavors from painting sets for community theater to working as a pastry chef and waitress. Catherine had an older sister, Shelley Grabinski, and was also the half-sister of actor Stephen Culp, known for his roles in The West Wing and Desperate Housewives, among other films. The paths of Brian and Catherine crossed at the Border Cafe on Main Street, where Catherine worked, and Brian frequently visited with Johnny. In 1990, they got married, and the House of Freaks released an album featuring a song dedicated to Catherine titled, I Got Happy. The couple welcomed two daughters into their lives, Stella Ann, their first daughter, born in 1996, and Ruby May, born in 2001. While Brian continued his musical pursuits, he also took on a job working on computers for the Henrico County school system. Catherine, on the other hand, embarked on the entrepreneurial path by opening World of Mirth, a unique toy and gift store that became a cornerstone in the fashionable Carytown neighborhood. Her brother, Stephen Culp, explained in court that she wanted to create a space where parents could come with their kids and spend time and kids could play with the toys without any toys that resembled weapons such as guns or swords. The Harvey family established their home in a stately old neighborhood on the south side of Richmond with large trees, porch swings, and ivy-covered surroundings. They had a family room in the basement of their two-story red brick house. The beautiful family was well known and beloved in the community of Richmond, and no one really had bad intentions towards them, or so everyone thought. On New Year's Day, Sunday 2006, Brian, his wife Catherine, and their two daughters, nine-year-old Stella and four-year-old Ruby, anticipated a bustling day ahead. Their plans included hosting a lunchtime barbecue for friends and family, prompting them to rise early and make preparations for the upcoming festivities. It had become a tradition for them to throw a party every New Year's Day, gathering their extensive circle of friends for the occasion. On that Sunday morning, Brian went outside their residence in the fashionable Woodland Heights area of Richmond, Virginia, to retrieve the newspaper. Absorbed in the front page news, he returned indoors without locking the door. Since they lived in a relatively safe neighborhood, this wouldn't normally have been a cause for concern. Typically, they also didn't secure the door on party days, leaving it open for arriving friends. However, on this day, unbeknownst to Brian, opportunistic criminals were secretly lurking nearby. Catherine was busily preparing cookies in the kitchen for the anticipated guests who were expected to arrive shortly. Suddenly, she heard voices emanating from the living room. Assuming someone had arrived earlier than expected, she approached the living room, only to be confronted not by familiar faces, but by two unknown men. In the tense moments that followed, Brian, Catherine, and young Ruby were directed to go downstairs to the basement playroom. Stella, who had spent the previous night at a slumber party, had not yet joined them. Once the family was confined to the small space, the intruders used electrical cords and packing tape to restrain them, 
ensuring their cooperation to prevent any harm as the intruders proceeded to ransack the house. Around 10 a.m., a knock on the front door interrupted them. The apparent leader of the group released Catherine from her restraints and instructed her to deal with whoever was at the door. However, before allowing her to leave, he issued a stern warning. If she sought help or attempted to escape, her daughter and husband would be murdered, as the imminent arrival of Stella was threatened. A distressed Catherine found herself in a difficult dilemma. Answering the door would expose her daughter to the same danger as the rest of the family, while ignoring the persistent knocking could incur the wrath of the assailant, who clearly had the upper hand. Ultimately, she decided that cooperation was the most prudent choice, and with that decision, she opened the door. In an unexpected turn of events, Stella swiftly darted past Catherine and made her way directly to the playroom where the family usually spent a lot of time together. Acting quickly, Catherine intercepted her daughter's friend, preventing her from following. Karen Perkinson, the friend's mother, later recounted her surprise at Catherine's unusual behavior, which deviated from her typical exuberance. In response to Perkinson's inquiry about her well-being, Catherine, normally lively, claimed to be unwell and gestured with a circular motion to the side of her head, mimicking a gun, to indicate someone might be considered crazy, abruptly ending the conversation and shutting the door. This peculiar gesture would later trouble Perkinson, who wondered if Catherine was attempting to convey that Kathy was being monitored by the intruders, and could she have attempted an escape, potentially saving herself and Stella. However, the dilemma of leaving Brian and Ruby behind weighed heavily on Catherine's mind. Perkinson left, intending to return later for the party. With all four member of Harvey's family now inside the house, Catherine went back to the basement and found a terrified Stella, who had been securely tied up along with the rest of the family. As everyone lay bound and vulnerable, chaos suddenly and unexpectedly erupted. The man in charge revealed a knife taken from the Harvey's kitchen and began slashing their throats, including those of the young girls, expressing frustration that they were not dying quickly enough. He ordered his accomplice to bludgeon their heads but the partner refused, prompting the assailant to grab a claw hammer and ruthlessly strike them repeatedly until they stopped moving. After removing Catherine Harvey's wedding ring, the assailants used wine as an accelerant to set the room on fire and conceal evidence of their heinous acts. As they made their escape from the residence, they helped themselves to a plate of freshly baked cookies that were cooling on the kitchen counter and stole a laptop, DVD player, and various other items. Rushing out, they entered a getaway vehicle parked outside, where a woman who was in a relationship with one of the men was serving as a lookout during what was initially intended as a simple robbery. They quickly departed, leaving the scene as inconspicuously as they had arrived. Sometime later, around 1.30 p.m., Johnny Holt arrived for the celebratory gathering Upon opening the front door, he was greeted by a dense cloud of smoke pouring out, alarmed by the strong smell of burning. He alerted the neighbors, who quickly called 911. As emergency responders entered the premises and dealt with the fire, they unfortunately found four bodies in the smoldering basement, still intact. Investigators at the scene soon determined that the fire did not cause the victims' deaths but rather a more sinister cause of death was uncovered. This had now become a murder investigation. Police officers and paramedics, who were accustomed to witnessing the darkest aspects of humanity, were reportedly so distressed by the harrowing scene that some of them openly shed tears. The revelation that the parents had been forced to witness the brutal deaths of their children, and vice versa, was heartbreaking to imagine. Autopsies revealed that Brian and Catherine died from blunt force trauma to the head. Stella tragically succumbed to a combination of blunt force trauma and smoke inhalation, suggesting she was alive when the fire started, despite her severe injuries. Ruby's death resulted from stab wounds to her neck and back. Despite initiating an immediate investigation into the murders, the authorities had little evidence. 
Recognizing the potential for criminals to divulge information, they appealed to the public for assistance. And fortunately, their breakthrough came a few days later, on January 6th. A woman named Latoya Pai contacted the police, requesting them to perform a welfare check on her friend, 21-year-old Ashley Bazil. Pai expressed her concerns as she believed that Ashley's boyfriend, 29-year-old Rye Joseph Dandridge, and his uncle, 29-year-old Ricky Javin Gray, were involved in the murder of the Harvey family. Ricky, who was slightly younger than his nephew by a few months, was said to be the one in charge. The shocking revelation continued as Pai disclosed that the two men had stored evidence of their crimes at her residence. She revealed that Gray and Dandridge had recently visited her home with a laptop that had an image of the Harveys as its wallpaper. And the Harvey case had by then received extensive coverage in the news, leaving no doubt that the laptop belonged to them. Additionally, Latoya provided detailed information about a plan devised by Ashley, Gray and Dandridge to rob Ashley's parents. In this plan, Ashley was supposed to pretend to be a hostage, allowing Ricky and Gray to extort money from the Brazil Tuckers, which would make Ashley appear innocent, even though she was aware of the entire plan and had been offered a role. Latoya declined, becoming suspicious of the trio. The uncle and nephew were the only ones that returned hours later, and when asked about Ashley's whereabouts, they cryptically replied, Ashley has gone bye-bye. This statement heightened Latoya's concerns, prompting her to contact the police. It was this crucial information that investigators needed to start connecting the dots. Having confirmed Latoya's information, investigators proceeded to the residence where Ashley resided with her mother, 46-year-old Mary Bazil Tucker, and stepfather, 55-year-old Purcell Tucker, to their horror, they encountered yet another gruesome scene. Upon entering the home, they discovered the lifeless bodies of all three victims who had been subjected to a brutal method similar to the Harvey family's fate. The victims were bound, gagged, and had their throats mercilessly slit. Duct tape wound tightly around their heads had inflicted additional suffering on Mary and Purcell, who both displayed deep neck lacerations. Purcell had a sock forcibly inserted into his throat, and Ashley tragically was found to have been suffocated with a plastic bag. The common cause of death for all three was determined to be suffocation and torture. Suspecting the presence of killers, law enforcement agencies from across the region collaborated in a joint effort to apprehend them before they could commit further atrocities. Harvey, Purcell, and Mary led quiet, peaceful lives without any known enemies. Purcell worked as a forklift operator, while Mary was employed by a housekeeping business. Their tranquil existence was shattered by the betrayal of their own daughter, which ultimately led to the tragic demise of an innocent couple who was simply trying to enjoy their retirement years. The investigators swiftly uncovered the crucial link between the Harvey and Tucker cases. Ashley was found wearing Brian Harvey's wedding band, the same one that was missing and taken from Catherine. With this revelation, urgent action was imperative to apprehend Gray and Dandridge before they could inflict further irreparable harm. They traced their movements back to their home state of Pennsylvania, and Gray and Dandridge were captured in Philadelphia on January 7th. In questioning, Dandridge asserted that the murders had been conceived by his uncle, and he had merely followed instructions. Faced with these incriminating accusations, Gray readily admitted to the killings of the Harveys and his involvement in those of Ashley and her parents. While these straightforward confessions were enough to leave anyone astounded, it became apparent that this was just the beginning. Gray provided gruesome, intricate details of both family massacres emphasizing that their actions were driven solely by the need for money. During the Harvey family murders, unbeknownst to everyone, Gray was under the influence of PCP, a drug known for inducing auditory and visual hallucinations, as well as violent behavior. Throughout his confession, Gray maintained a chilling, emotionless stare, and his utter indifference towards the lives he took led investigators to believe they were face-to-face -face with the devil incarnate. 
It was also revealed that Gray was responsible for the murder of his wife, Trevor Terrell Gray, whose body was uncovered in a shallow grave on Brookside Avenue in Washington, Pennsylvania. The couple had been married for six months prior to her tragic murder and resided together in a house owned by Trevor's family along with Gray's nephew, Rarai. According to Trevor's parents, the Grays frequently engaged in bitter arguments and claw marks on Rye's forearm were even discovered on the day Trevor's body was found. Despite being interviewed by Washington police, neither Gray nor Dandridge were initially considered suspects. Trevor's mother, Manor Squires, alleged that law enforcement assumed Trevor had succumbed to a drug overdose, leading to a lackadaisical investigation into her death. Although Trevor's demise was deemed suspicious at the time, a homicide investigation was only initiated after Gray's confession in 2006. On December 31, 2005, a brutal assault unfolded where 26-year-old Ryan K.Y. was attacked by two men in front of his parents' Arlington home, who were later identified as Gray and Dandridge. The assault left Kai with severe beating and stab wounds to the chest, neck, and arms, resulting in a near-fatal assault that caused him to spend the following two weeks in a coma and permanently lose the use of his right arm. On February 9, 2006, Ricky Gray faced five charges of capital murder, while Ray Dandridge was indicted on three counts of murder for his involvement in the Baskerville Tucker killings. Despite their earlier admissions, both men pleaded not guilty. After a six-month trial, the jury found Gray guilty on all counts, leading to a life sentence for the murders of Brian and Catherine Harvey. In response to the brutal taking of Stella and Ruby's lives, the court deemed nothing less than a death sentence appropriate. In September 2006, following his uncle's conviction and after learning the verdict in his case, Dandridge opted for a plea deal to evade the death penalty. He received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In December 2006, Ricky Gray faced charges from Chesterfield County for the murder of Cheryl Warner, a 37-year-old legal secretary and mother of three. Warner was discovered shot and hanged by an electrical cord in the basement of her burning beaver residence. Gray entered a not guilty plea, however, on June 4, 2008, the charge was suspended due to conflicting evidence. Over the subsequent nine years, Gray's legal team pursued numerous appeals, primarily arguing that their client suffered from diminished capacity due to an abusive childhood. The case reached the Supreme Court, where it was summarily rejected in 2016. In November 2016, Gray was scheduled to be executed on January 18, 2017. On January 18, 2017, with all of his appeals exhausted, Ricky Gray was executed by lethal injection at Greensville Correctional Center. Ray Dandridge remains incarcerated at Sussex State Prison. The brutal murders of the Harvey family unleashed an overwhelming wave of horror and sorrow, with over 1,400 individuals attending their memorial service, expressing their condolences and grief. Flowers and dolls piled up and formed a poignant tribute along the curb outside the red brick house. Children placed candles, which maintained their glow for weeks. A neighbor reflected on the community's collective mourning, stating that they kept those candles lit for weeks. Catherine's brother, Culp, testified about the profound impact of the murders, describing them as a lightning bolt to the heart that felt bottomless. He further expressed his pain in thinking about the Harvey family's last hours. In Richmond's Forest Hill Park, an entrance to a footbridge is adorned with a granite monument, a poignant dedication to the Harvey family. This family, who had previously enjoyed many joyful moments at the site, saw their lives abruptly and tragically cut short. A bronze plaque depicting their radiant smiles serves as a commemoration of happier days before the unfathomable evil infiltrated their lives, devastating everything in its wake. It is a sad and unfortunate tale. And our thoughts are with the victims whose lives were tragically cut short and the loved ones they left behind. The Inman family projected an image of perfect harmony to those on the outside. 
they were regular churchgoers every Sunday to Warwood Port Singh. Yet within their tight-knit circle, one could fathom what really happened behind closed doors. Back in three, William and Sandra Inman's paths crossed at church. He was 18, she just 16. Their union received their parents' blessing, leading to marriage. The couple made their home in the modest community of Logan, located in Hawking County, Ohio. Bill Inman possessed strong religious convictions and balanced his job in construction with playing musical instruments for the Sky of Faith Evangelical Church in Nelsonville, Ohio. Sandra took on the role of managing the household. In 1984, they were delighted to welcome their son, William Jr. To distinguish between father and son, the head of the family was called Bill, while the younger one was known as Will. As time passed, William Jr. grew up. At age 17, in 2001, he met a 15-year-old named Summer Cook at church, quite reminiscent of his parents' encounter. Will and Summer maintained a friendship for three years before getting married when Summer turned 18 in 2004. The newlyweds began their life together by residing with Will's parents in a spacious house in Logan, Ohio. In that same year, when Bill reached the age of 39, he envisioned himself as a spiritual guide. Transforming his garage into a makeshift sanctuary, he began hosting gatherings there. Despite local skepticism towards this self-declared minister's actions, his enigmatic garage started to attract neighbors first, then their friends, and more individuals seeking solace through prayer and leaving offerings. By 2005, Will and Summer were overjoyed with the birth of their son Alex. Around this time, financial strains began affecting the Inman household since Bill's religious endeavors were not financially rewarding. This situation led the family to consider relocating to another state in pursuit of better employment opportunities. By 2006, the Inman family had fully resettled in Florida. Both Bill and Will promptly secured employment in hotel construction. Meanwhile, Sandra and Summer dedicated themselves to homemaking and nurturing young Alex. Two years later, the Inmans made their way back to Ohio from Florida. By then, they had forfeited their Logan home due to an inability to reclaim it and settled in a rental in Vinton's countryside. Starting a new chapter shortly after their relocation, in 2008, Will and Summer welcomed their second child, a daughter named Kelly. By 2010, their family grew with the arrival of another daughter, Alana. As young parents, Will and Summer often sought weekends away for relaxation and rejuvenation. During these times, Bill and Sandra, always supportive, took on the role of caring for their grandchildren. The weekends were filled with joy as they cherished moments with their three grandchildren. In the spring of 2010, Bill Inman secured a pastor's license and proclaimed himself the head of the Skinnier Faith Church. Alongside his wife, he established a charitable entity named Ranch of Mercy to assist the jobless and homeless. His vision was grand. He wanted to construct a large dwelling for orphans and widows. However, financial resources were quite lacking. To address this issue, Bill conceived a lottery scheme. Each participant would purchase a ticket with proceeds earmarked for building the shelter. The grand prize was either a house or $200,000 plus 99 other significant rewards. The community became aware of this lottery through news and advertisements. Bill initially promoted it door to door, assuring participants of lavish rewards while emphasizing that surplus funds were destined for providing a haven for the destitute. Priced at $10 per ticket, Bill managed to sell 100,000 tickets amassing $1 million for the project. The drawing was set for September 2010. In June 2010, personal upheaval struck the Inman family when Summer expressed her desire to divorce Will after six years of marriage. This declaration came not long after she had penned a significant entry in her personal diary. I am utterly exhausted from constantly trying to please everyone around me. Do not deserve happiness. Do I not have the right to love someone and feel that love in return? I'm uncertain if now is the appropriate time, but I feel compelled to share everything with Will. It troubles me deeply, yet he deserves to know the truth. He should be aware that I no longer wish to be with him. 
I need to be alone to rediscover myself and understand my current identity. At this moment, I feel like a servant, perpetually running around and obeying others' commands. I adore my children with all my heart and would never trade them for anything. However, I don't want them to grow up witnessing their mother merely following orders all the time. I'm unsure how Will might react to this revelation. There's a chance he could become angry, attempt to take the children away, or worse, resort to threats or harm. It's important for our children to see us as equals. I'm aware that Will's parents might turn against me and try to convince me to stay, but such actions won't change anything. Last night, when Will asked me what I wanted, my mind was blank. All I could think of was what I don't want. I don't want to feel unhappy and trapped any longer, but I couldn't bring myself to voice these thoughts. So instead, I sat there in silence. Every day feels like a battle. All I yearn for is rest, to cry and sleep without interruption. But finding a way out of this situation seems impossible at times. My hope is that by the time of my next journal entry, I'll have clarity on how to resolve everything. As the summer progressed, we moved forward with the divorce proceedings. Departing from the Inman residence, I took our son and both daughters along with my personal belongings. We sought refuge at my parents' home. Wanting not to disrupt the children's relationship with their father or grandparents, visits were scheduled regularly for them. Two months following our separation in August 2010, I began a relationship with Adam Peters while also securing employment at a bank in Logan's downtown area, working in a cleaning capacity due cle to limited educational background. When September arrived, it marked another significant event, the Ranch of Mercy's house raffle, spearheaded by the Inman family. Although construction on the prize house was supposed to begin, both September and October passed without any progress. No raffle took place, and no explanations were given. The organization didn't seem to rush to refund participants either. By December 1st, 2010, the Inmans got a notice requiring them to leave their rented residence due to significant unpaid rent. In response, Summer and Adam went to collect her remaining belongings from the Inman home. However, they were denied entry. This led Summer to call the police, reporting that her estranged husband was intimidating her and preventing her from retrieving her possessions. When the police arrived, Will and his parents continued to block access. Will even escalated matters by threatening Adam and clashing with an officer. Consequently, Summer filed a legal complaint against Will. She reflected on their relationship, recalling how idyllic it seemed before marriage, but lamenting its drastic change afterward. Will's behavior reportedly became very controlling, affecting everything from her diet to household responsibilities and even intimate aspects of their life. She wasn't allowed to sleep without his approval and was confined at home without access to her phone or keys. Summer revealed Will's aspirations for a large family, his interest in polygamy, and his activities on related websites, including posting inappropriate images. She also disclosed threats he made if she pursued divorce and mentioned how her cats mysteriously disappeared. Will attributed their disappearance nonchalantly to them escaping through an open window. Following Summer's allegations, Will provided his version of events. He justified taking Summer's phone and keys by suggesting he suspected her of infidelity. Regarding the cats, he said that due to their wild behavior and damage caused to furniture and family members, he relocated them to a shelter. As a result of these conflicts and accusations, Will was subjected to a restraining order, preventing him from approaching Summer and faced penalties and probation amidst further investigations. A fierce battle for custody emerged between the families. The Inmans filed police report against Adam Peters, labeling him a potential threat to the safety of Alex, Kelly, and Alana. Tragically, Summer's life took a dark turn. On the night March 22, 2011, Summerman, just 25 years old, was finishing her shift at the bank. She wrapped up her cleaning duties after the office had closed. Around 11 p.m., she stepped outside to dispose of the trash. Summer had texted her partner Adam to meet her after work, but he didn't find her by 11.30 p.m. Worried, Adam arrived at the bank and began his search. 
he discovered her personal items scattered near a dumpster in an alley, her phone, keys, and a music player still playing with headphones nearby in the grass. Her jacket lay there too. Alarmed, Adam immediately contacted Summer's parents to inform them of her disappearance and stressed the need to alert the police swiftly. Initially, Summer's parents called the bank, guessing she might have stayed longer for extra work and misplaced her belongings. Security personnel had no clues about her whereabouts. They then contacted Logan police to report Summer missing, emphasizing her punctuality and that she rarely stayed late at work. Police arrived at the scene where they found Summer's belongings. They heard accounts from three eyewitnesses who saw her abduction about an hour earlier. Two women out for an evening jog reported seeing Summer as she threw out the trash. At that moment, a white Ford Crown Victoria, driven by a blonde woman, approached. Two individuals dressed in black balaclavas exited the vehicle and forcefully grabbed Summer, shoving her into the back seat despite her resistance and cries for help. One bystander's attempt to intervene was thwarted when the female driver incapacitated him with pepper spray, forcing him to retreat. The car quickly left the area, the two jogging witnesses immediately headed to the nearest police station to report what they had witnessed. Their account initially faced skepticism from the police, who found their narrative peculiar and doubted its authenticity. Expecting it, it might be a fabricated story. The police reached the abduction site of Summer Inman just an hour after her parents filed the missing person report. However, initial efforts did not lead to locating the missing 25-year-old. News of Summerman's kidnapping quickly circulated through all local media outlets, capturing the community's attention. Hundreds of Logan's residents united in a concerted effort to locate her. As three days elapsed, the possibility of finding Summer safe and sound grew increasingly faint. Throughout this harrowing time, her parents endeavored to maintain hope against despairing thoughts. Shortly before her disappearance, Summer Inman shared a photo on Facebook featuring herself, her new partner Adam, and her children. The image portrayed them as a content family unit. Will Inman, who had access to Adam Peters' Facebook page, surprisingly still on his friends list despite being Summer's current partner, noticed this update. It raises an intriguing question. Why would a husband befriend his wife's new companion? The backstory revealed that Adam a man without stable employment had been hired by the Inmans a year earlier, in spring 2010, for various household tasks. It was then that Adam and Summer crossed paths and developed a bond. Despite initial reluctance, Summer eventually reciprocated Adam's affections. Her diary entry reflects this internal conflict. When I looked into his eyes, I realized that the devil had taken over me. I didn't listen to what God was telling me. I tried to stop. My mind screamed, run, get out of here now, but instead I stayed and let him embrace me and then delve deeper. I am very sorry about this. I am guilty. This encounter signified the unraveling of Summer's life within the Inman family. Yearning for happiness and love, she initiated divorce proceedings which were prolonged five days before vanishing. Will Contested tested the proposed spousal support per child monthly suggesting a reduction to $50 given his annual earnings of just $6,000. Will and his parents sought full custody of the children, but their petition was rejected by the court. After losing contact with their grandchildren, Bill and Sandra visibly deteriorated. They lost weight and were clearly affected, as those who knew them concurred that the grandchildren were the light of their lives. In March 2011, amidst the investigation into Summer's disappearance, the Inman family was located. They were found at the residence of Bill's 70-year-old mother in Jackson, Ohio. Bill, Sandra, and Will collectively asserted their ignorance regarding Summer's abduction. The Inmans recounted that on the night of Summer's kidnapping, they were en route to Cleveland to view a new property. However, they encountered car trouble after three hours on the road leading to an overnight ordeal of vehicular repairs on the roadside before returning to Logan the next morning. They maintained that their interactions with Summer were generally amicable with infrequent disputes. Yet they attributed a shift in their familial harmony 
to Adam Peter's employment in their household, describing this phase as challenging. The trio consistently portrayed Adam as a negative influence, alleging he was the catalyst for the disintegration of their previously harmonious and tightly knit family. The investigation took a crucial turn when police noticed a white Ford Crown Victoria at the Inman family's residence. Upon inspection of the vehicle, a GPS receiver was confiscated. Subsequent examination revealed that on March 22nd, the day Summer was abducted, this car was in Logan. The GPS was deactivated at 5.30 p.m. that evening and reactivated the next morning again in Logan, contradicting the Inman's claim of traveling to Cleveland. Phone records further corroborated that all three family members were in Logan on both March 22nd and 23rd. Additional inquiries revealed that on the morning of March 23rd, around 7.30 a.m., the Inmans were at a car wash engaging in a thorough interior cleaning of the vehicle. Bill, Sandra and Will were all present, but Summer was notably absent following this event. They visited an auto shop in Cleveland for a tire change. While there, a shop employee noticed something odd. Bill was choosing to replace nearly new tires with used ones, simply because he didn't like his current set chained. There was also evidence that the Inmans attempted to modify the car's appearance. Notably, Bill had removed a police spotlight that had previously been mounted on the driver's side door next to the mirror. Bill, Sandra, and Will Inman were apprehended and brought in for interrogation. Prior to their arrest, Bill assured his elderly mother of their innocence, attributing the situation to a test from the devil. Throughout the questioning, they consistently claimed they were unaware of Summer Inman's abduction and didn't know who the kidnapper was. However, after several hours and faced with the possibility of capital punishment if convicted, Sandra Inman's resolve faltered. Eventually, she disclosed the truth. Sandra confessed that they were responsible for Summer's abduction on the night of March 22nd. She detailed how Bill and Will had disguised themselves in black masks. Sandra admitted that her initial plan was merely to abduct and intimidate Summer. However, events took an unexpected and tragic turn. According to Sandra's confession, when Summer was forcibly placed in the car's back seat, Will restrained her with plastic ties around her neck hands and feet, intending merely to frighten her into granting him access to their children. As the situation escalated, Will realized that Summer was on the brink of unconsciousness. He panicked and desperately searched for a knife to release her, shouting frantically to his mother, Oh my God, Mom! Where's the knife? I can't find it. Amidst their collective fear and desperate search for the knife, the situation worsened. Summer ceased breathing and tragically passed away. Sandra maintained that their objective was never to take Summer's life. They merely sought a resolution to their custody dispute and hoped to ensure regular visits with their grandchildren. On March 29, 2011, a week after the kidnapping, Sandra Inman disclosed the location of the body. Summer's remains were found in a septic tank on the grounds of Skinnier Faith Church near Nelsonville, about 30 kilometers from her workplace. Bill Inman had been involved in the church's construction. This place held personal significance for him and Sandra, as it was where they had married 28 years earlier. The Inmans were regulars at this church. Bill participated in its musical ensemble. Police uncovered the well by removing a concrete slab and unscrewing six bolts from the metal lid. When they opened it, they immediately saw Summer's legs. She had been thrown headfirst into the septic tank, still wearing her work attire. Her black t-shirt bore an ironic inscription, I don't have anger issues, I have issues with idiots. A forensic examination confirmed that Summer had succumbed to strangulation. Apart from marks on her neck, hands and legs indicating she'd been restrained, no other injuries were found on her body. This highlighted strangulation as the cause of her tragic demise. Sandra revealed that she originally planned to dispose of the body in a river, but reconsidered and decided it would be safer to conceal it in the well near the church. She believed this location would ensure it remained undiscovered for a long time. Sandra admitted to feeling deep shame for her actions and their irreversible consequences. During the subsequent trial, 
49-year-old Bill Inman and 28-year-old Will Inman did not take any responsibility for Summer's death. Throughout the proceedings, they stayed mostly silent, showing no visible emotions and avoiding eye contact with Summer's grieving parents. Sandra Inman, at 47 years old, stood out as the only family member who accepted responsibility for her part in the tragic events. She maintained that the plan to intimidate Summer was entirely her own idea. In a deeply emotional moment before sentencing, Sandra, overcome with tears, faced Summer's parents and begged for their forgiveness. Her speech, though broken by sobs and a quivering voice, clearly expressed remorse. Sandra admitted she saw Summer as a daughter and regretted her catastrophic decision. In 2012, the verdict was handed down. All three members of the Inman family were convicted. Bill and Will Inman received life sentences without the possibility of parole. Sandra Inman also got a life sentence, but with eligibility for parole after serving 15 years. However, among friends and church members familiar with the family's dynamics, doubts arose about Sandra being the mastermind behind the crime. It was commonly known that Bill had a dominant role in the family and usually made final decisions on all matters. Will, on his part, was seen as a pampered child whose desires were always met by his parents. Those close to the family speculated that Sandra's confession might have been a strategic move to reduce legal consequences for her husband and son. Currently, Alex and Alana are being raised by Summer's family. For quite some time, it was hard to explain to these grandchildren where their mother, father, grandmother, and grandfather had gone. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Lindsay Wilson. In the spring of 1999, the community of Southport in the United Kingdom was divided into two camps. The media and television were filled with numerous interviews with Mitchell Kwai, a man who, though unremarkable at first, had become a true folk hero. His sudden popularity was sparked by a scandal. The mysterious disappearance of his wife, Lindsay Wilson, according to him, one day she left home without a trace, leaving behind two young children. Her distraught husband appeared worried and abandoned, pleading for her to reconsider and return. Along the way, he shared details of their marital life, occasionally speaking unfavorably about his spouse. He believed her behavior was driven by a desire for a free and extravagant lifestyle. Mitchell mentioned seeing his former beloved driving around town in an expensive car, although she just passed by. Most likely, the grief-stricken mother had left her children for a wealthy fiancé. Despite the image portrayed on TV, in reality, he was enjoying a bachelor's life. As a result, one segment of the population sympathized with the lonely man, offering him attention and support, while the other doubted him and suspected him of a horrendous crime. While Mitchell enjoyed widespread attention, law enforcement continued to search for the missing woman. His persona did not inspire trust, and there were complications in the case. According to Lindsay's relatives and friends, the couple's relationship was different from what her husband claimed. Everyone who knew her considered her a faithful wife and caring mother. Therefore, they were convinced something terrible must have happened to Lindsay. Otherwise, she would have made contact long ago. Suspicion was fueled by Mitchell's words during a famous talk show. When the host asked if he had ended his wife's life, his guest said he would not respond to such an indecent question, then paused and added, wait and find out. What was the exemplary husband and father implying? Perhaps he knew more than he shared, or was he so confident in his innocence that he was just waiting for everything to fall into place? Answers to these and other questions are forthcoming. At 17, Lindsay discovered she was pregnant. Raised in a caring, large family, she hadn't imagined becoming a mother so early. She wasn't unprepared emotionally, but the fact that her boyfriend, with whom she'd been since she was 13, fled as soon as he learned about the impending fatherhood, both upset and scared her. Lindsay knew all too well the physical and financial demands of motherhood. The Wilson family, though loving and close-knit, had often faced financial challenges to provide for their children. Her parents worked tirelessly, 
Therefore, when Lindsay met Mitchell Kwai five months into her pregnancy, she considered it a gift of fate. Mitchell, a 20-year-old, acted like a true gentleman, being attentive and caring. Most importantly, her delicate condition did not deter him. Mitchell assured her he had fallen in love with Lindsay at first sight and wanted to spend his life with her and raise the child as his own. At that time, he was earning well and even started working extra hours, so his beloved would want for nothing. The young couple's parents were shocked when they announced their decision to marry. They felt the five-week-old relationship hadn't withstood the test of time and circumstances, and thus couldn't genuinely celebrate for them. The only thing Lindsay's relatives noted was that her former cheerfulness and good health had returned. At the same time, the new boyfriend seemed overly sweet to them, even cloyingly polite. Ultimately, no one interfered with their marriage, keeping their doubts to themselves. Red flag, the wedding took place in August 1995 within a close family circle. The majority of the guests were from the bride's side. The groom's side was represented by no more than five people, his parents, a brother, and two friends. During the celebration, Lindsay was ecstatic, believing she had won the lottery in life. However, the uneasy premonitions of Lindsay's relatives grew heavier when, by the end of the evening, the newlyweds had a dispute. The conflict unfolded before everyone's eyes. Something displeased Mitchell, and he started to shout loudly. It was unlikely that the reason was significant or appropriate for such a reaction. During the argument, he grabbed his new wife by the hand and started shaking her, which looked more than odd and threatening. Lindsay tried to calm him down. When the emotions subsided, the man apologized to everyone and later made light of the incident, emphasizing that it was just nerves due to the holiday bustle. At that moment, the girl did not give due attention to the situation and quickly forgot about it. However, in reality, it became one of the red flags in their toxic relationship. On February 5, 1999, a social worker officially reported Lindsay missing, expressing concern over being unable to reach her client. Lindsay had sought psychological support in a short period of their life together due to recurring incidents of domestic violence and had bravely reported the situation at home. After her disclosure, the social worker had been monitoring the young family. She informed the police that she had been unable to contact Lindsay for several weeks. Every time she visited the home, Lindsay's husband would answer the door, and he was also the first to answer any phone calls. The dedicated worker mentioned that she repeatedly asked to speak directly to Lindsay, but received evasive excuses. During her visits, she consistently left her contact details, yet Lindsay never called back. The social worker found this situation unsafe and requested a welfare check. Law enforcement responded to the report and visited the address, but were also unable to speak with Lindsay. Her husband, Mitchell, explained that he had not seen his wife at home for a long time, but did not consider her missing. According to him, on Christmas Eve, Lindsay had gone to a party with a friend and returned home early in the morning, somewhat intoxicated. They had an argument, and afterwards, Lindsay packed her belongings and left, without saying goodbye to the children. He claimed she left him for another man and no longer wanted any contact. The search for Lindsay began. During conversations with her relatives, officers learned that she was last seen by her family on December 11th, appearing in high spirits, looking well, and her behavior was normal. Her family had grown accustomed to her troubled marriage. Lindsay's mother also reported that she had tried multiple times to reach her daughter on December 24th to arrange a visit to give Christmas gifts to the grandchildren. Unable to reach Lindsay, she decided to visit in person that day. Mitchell answered the door with the children and told her that his wife had left with friends and accused her of infidelity. However, Mrs. Wilson had long learned to take her son-in-law's words with a grain of salt. After giving the gifts to the children, she left. Detectives found it strange that no one had been concerned about the young woman's well-being for two months. However, there was an explanation. Everyone knew that Mitchell restricted his wife's interactions with the outside world, even with close relatives. 
they had previously experienced difficulty communicating with her. Therefore, it was plausible for Lindsay to drop out of sight for a while. Nonetheless, this did not mean they were not concerned about her. The news alarmed them. Everyone asserted that she did not drink and led a modest lifestyle. Moreover, her husband had forbidden her all contact with the outside world, not to mention meetings with friends and acquaintances. Mitchell told the police contradictory information that aroused the investigator's suspicions about his character. It seemed unlikely that Mitchell could simply let his wife go and that Lindsay would leave her children with a tyrannical husband. However, the situation demanded a thorough investigation. To this end, the police spoke with all of Lindsay's acquaintances and tried to find anyone who had seen her after the family gathering. They also questioned neighbors and requested surveillance footage from the residential complex where the couple lived and its surroundings. Unfortunately, all footage had been deleted by the time Lindsay's disappearance was noted. Some time had elapsed. However, another date was discovered when she was last seen in person. On December 15th, she was at the local post office sending several letters and postcards as usual. Her older sister also admitted that they met that day. Lindsay had visited despite Mitchell's disapproval. The sisters had tea and a brief conversation, after which Lindsay saw her guest out. On the way, she slipped a note into her sister's hand and asked her to read it later. The sister put the note in her purse and in the whirlwind of days forgot about it. Regrettably, the older sister couldn't find it later and its contents remain unknown. After that day, no one saw Lindsay again. Over several months, Investigators tried to cling to any information. They began to suspect that she was no longer alive as she had not been in contact for so long. They couldn't charge Mitchell without sufficient grounds and evidence. However, the more they learned about the couple's life history, the stronger their suspicions grew. Shortly after their wedding, Mitchell and Lindsay decided to move away from their parents. They rented an apartment in Southport. Sometime later, Lindsay gave birth to a daughter named Robin. The only shadow over the joy of the new baby was her stepfather's volatile temper. After moving, the young wife fully experienced her husband's unstable moods. One moment, he could be joking and laughing. The next, he became unbalanced and aggressive. Trying to maintain a fragile peace at home, she didn't realize how completely she had submitted to his will. He controlled every step she took and caused a scene whenever she failed to hear the phone or answer a call. However, loud arguments were often followed by passionate reconciliations. Mitchell would kneel, beg for forgiveness, and profess his love. It seemed for a while that peace had returned to the family, but then the cycle would start again. Conflict, reconciliation, repetition. Lindsay began to lose recognition of the man she loved. She often told her relatives about what was happening, they advised her to return home and end her suffering, but it was hard for the young woman to admit her mistake. In one interview, the Wilsons mentioned that she always lived with thoughts of the past. Each time, her husband assured her he would change and everything would be fine. As a loving wife, she wanted to believe him and waited for him to return to his former self, gentle and caring. Meanwhile, Mitchell increasingly tightened his grip and control, he forbade his wife to go out alone in the evenings and eventually restricted her from being anywhere without him. He was jealous of her every move, yet he himself was seen in dubious liaisons. Once, Lindsay confided to her older sister that she suspected her husband of infidelity. She told her about a woman who came to their home looking for him and was very surprised to learn he was married. That day, another argument erupted, but this time, it escalated to physical violence. Gradually, physical abuse became a part of their life. To prevent his wife from complaining about him and tarnishing his reputation, the man began to limit her interactions, starting with neighbors, friends, and acquaintances, and later with her family. Despite being unhappy, Lindsay still tried to maintain contact secretly, fearing being discovered and punished. At the same time, despite the evident problems, Lindsay continued to stay with Mitchell. Along with her feelings, the comfortable life he provided was a factor. He earned well, supporting her and their child, paying the bills. 
she truly lacked nothing financially. The era of living in a gilded cage came to an end for Lindsay when she found out she was pregnant again. At that moment, she was certain she no longer wanted more children. It's only fair to note that Mitchell was good to his stepdaughter, even loving her. However, Lindsay deemed the current circumstances unfavorable for bringing another child into the world and decided to terminate the pregnancy. When her husband learned of this, he became enraged, hurling insults and physically intimidating her. That same evening, she packed her things, took her child and returned to her parents' home. Her family breathed a sigh of relief. There, she proceeded with the pregnancy as she had planned. Over time, however, she began to miss her husband. He wouldn't leave her alone, frequently calling and begging her to come back. Mitchell tried everything to prove he had changed, and eventually, he managed to convince Lindsay. Initially, everything went well, and it seemed as if their old feelings had returned. The couple was expecting another child. This peace lasted for six months until Mitchell had a severe anger outburst. Fortunately, he did not direct his rage at his pregnant wife, but took it out on the apartment. He smashed everything he could see, destroyed furniture, ripped doors off their hinges, and even stained the walls with blood and food remnants. He threw the television out of the window and smashed the car parked outside. The landlord demanded not only compensation for the damage and repairs, but also that they vacate the apartment. This situation worsened the family's financial position, requiring additional expenses. As a result, the couple had to take out a large loan and move to a more modest apartment. You can't run from yourself. In October 1997, their son Jack was born. Mitchell adored the boy. However, the relationship between the spouses became increasingly tense. Throughout their married life, Mitchell frequently left home, sometimes for a few days, sometimes for a week, often over trivial or fabricated reasons. Lindsay had grown accustomed to her husband's behavior, yet when he abandoned her again, she filed for divorce and returned to her parents' home. Apparently, she realized she couldn't cope with the separation on her own. Therefore, she reached out to a local charity that assists women in difficult life situations. They helped her find subsidized housing in another city. Lindsay feared that Mitchell would discover her new address or phone number, so she took measures to distance herself from him. After he made several threats, she even obtained a restraining order from law enforcement. Mitchell remained unpopular with Lindsay's relatives. They too wanted nothing to do with him. Ultimately, their communication nearly ceased. Despite all efforts, Lindsay repeatedly returned to the abusive relationship. Thus, her circle saw no point in trying to save her anymore. They accepted the situation and stepped back. However, this time, her decision proved to be fatal. At the outset of the investigation into Lindsay's disappearance, Mitchell was initially helpful in the search efforts. However, as the case gained media attention, his focus shifted dramatically. He turned his misfortune into a public spectacle, becoming a media figure in the process. As Mitchell invited more journalists into his home, his abundant media appearances began to seem less genuine, with viewers often noting a smirk on his face. Lindsay's parents considered their son-in-law to be involved in their daughter's disappearance, and detectives also viewed him as the prime suspect. Yet, the lack of direct evidence tied their hands. Searches were conducted not just at the couple's home, but throughout the area. After a provocative question during a televised interview, the antagonist became even more brazen, even declaring that the time would come when his wife's family would have to apologize for their suspicions. On the eve of the holiday season, Mitchell sent a postcard to the lead investigator on the case. Attached to it was a pack of hair dye. Instead of a festive greeting, Mitchell wrote, I hope this covers your gray and gives you a bit more confidence, mocking the detective and displaying his own arrogance. In February 2000, Mitchell found himself at the center of a scandal with a tarnished reputation. It became known that he had been forging his wife's signature to receive social benefits, serving as another indirect proof of his involvement in Lindsay's disappearance and presumed demise. The investigators wanted to latch on to a financial motive. However, 
the suspect's popularity worked in his favor. Many supporters emerged, arguing that as a single father, he had every right to financial assistance. These circumstances hindered the detective's ability to bring the charges they desired. Nevertheless, they managed to charge him with fraud. Mitchell was brought to court for the benefit fraud and was found guilty, sentenced to a month of community service. This time, Mitchell couldn't walk away unscathed. The forgery of his missing wife's signature appeared more than suspicious. The number of angry comments increased. Eventually, the man's patience snapped and he began lashing out, blaming the media for intruding into his personal life. The case of Lindsay Mitchell's disappearance might have remained unsolved had it not been for a clue discovered by chance. On June 1st, 2000, a park goer noticed his dog acting strangely near the roller coaster at a city amusement park. The animal uncovered human remains. Specialists were called to the scene and the remains were sent for forensic examination, which revealed that they were parts of a female torso. Genetic testing confirmed they belonged to Lindsay, who had been missing for a long time. This breakthrough revitalized the investigation, making it clear that Lindsay had been the victim of a brutal crime. The focus now was to find the perpetrator. On June 7th, Mitchell was brought in for questioning. The detectives were determined, and after more than 36 hours of intermittent interrogation, the suspect broke down under the pressure and confessed to the dismemberment murder. On December 15th, 1998, after meeting with her sister, Lindsay informed her husband that she wanted a divorce. This time, she was resolute. According to Mitchell, this news infuriated him, leading him to attack and strangle her. The incident occurred in front of their children. He then hid her lifeless body in their bedroom, stuffing the gap under the door to mask any odors. Realizing he couldn't dispose of the body alone, he enlisted the help of his brother Elliot, a butcher, who he thought could assist. Elliot was initially hesitant, but was eventually persuaded by Mitchell. While the children played in the next room, they dismembered Lindsay's body and later dispersed her remains across the city. During his confession, the murderer expressed no remorse or empathy. Instead, he seemed proud of his actions, stating that without his confession, they would never have proven his guilt. The next day, he led them to the other locations where he had hidden her limbs. Sadly, her head and one hand were never recovered. The forensic comparison confirmed that the remains were indeed Lindsay's. There was no doubt about Mitchell's guilt. The final judgment at the trial of the Key brothers took place in January 2001. The court proceedings were swift and straightforward. Mitchell was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 17 years. The court-appointed psychiatrist noted that the defendant showed all the signs of being a narcissist with sadistic tendencies. His brother Elliot received a seven-year sentence for his role in concealing the crime. Lindsay's children were taken in by her maternal grandparents, who gave them their surname. Just three months after the sentence was handed down, another tragedy struck the Lindsay family. One of Lindsay's older brothers, unable to cope with the shock, took his own life in the attic of their family home. In his farewell note, he wrote that he saw no point in continuing in such a cruel world and wished to reunite with his sister. As of 2017, Mitchell Kwai has been eligible for parole. However, as of January 2023, his lawyer's requests have been denied three times. Lindsay's family, including the children, are concerned that the murderer might eventually be released. Consequently, they have started a petition urging that he remain incarcerated. As long as the voices of the victim's family are considered, the criminal will continue to serve his sentence. Regardless, no punishment can bring Lindsay back. Experience shows that most women with domestic Stockholm Syndrome try to adapt to their abusers throughout their lives even when their families come to their aid. They continue to act against their own best interests. In such cases, only deep self-reflection in psychotherapy can help. If the victim does not come to realize the recklessness of their actions, the end of the relationship will be dire. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. 
Today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Lorena Bobbitt. It's said that a humiliated and insulted woman is capable of anything, with the most terrifying in this list being revenge. Cruel, ingenious, and sometimes unpredictable. Much in this regard depends on the lady's level of sanity, but one must not overlook the depth of her hurt. This destructive emotion can be carefully hidden within a woman for years, but if it erupts, it will sweep away everything in its path. The story of the Bobbitt spouses in the early 90s shook the world, and their surname became a byword, spawning the verb to Bobbitt, which means to cut or to chop. This case drew heightened public attention, not just to the issues of domestic violence, but also to such a delicate subject as marital assault, which many try to sidestep. Lorena Leonor Bobbitt was born on May 15, 1970, in the town of Bukai, located in eastern Ecuador near the province of Chimborazo. She was the youngest child in a simple and very modest family. When she was in elementary school, her family moved to Venezuela and settled in Caracas. Lorena grew up quite clever. She performed well in school, was diligent and goal-oriented. In her teenage years, she lost her father and her relationship with her mother, Elvia Gallo was quite strained. As soon as she graduated from school, she decided to move to the United States to live with her cousin, Jana Basuti. Her relative gladly took her in and helped her with the paperwork for a student visa. However, she was a very conservative woman, so Lorena, living in her house, had to abide by a strict set of rules, just like Jana's own children, and also take on some of the household duties. Despite everything, the young woman decided to stay in the US as she realized that it offered her far more opportunities than Latin America. She had long been attracted to the beauty industry, so Gallo decided to train as a manicurist. Moreover, Basuti owned her own beauty salon located in the city center, had extensive experience in the field, and was eager to help her niece learn the profession by allowing her to observe the work of the specialists and practice on her own. Later, her aunt arranged for her to work part-time in her salon. About eight months after she moved to the new country, the young woman had settled in, enrolled in college, and was working as a manicurist in her relative's salon while gradually saving money. In September 1988, Lorena was preparing to go to a party with several of her friends. Her aunt gave her strict instructions on how to behave and what time she needed to be home and she promised that everything would be fine. The modest young beauty was nervous as it was her first time preparing to go to a nightlife establishment late at night. She chose a relatively modest outfit, unlike her friends, applied makeup, and styled her hair fashionably. Upon arriving at the nightclub, she was struck by the carefree and festive atmosphere. Inside, the venue was filled with young people dancing, having fun, and socializing, and Lorena couldn't help but think that such a place might be where she could meet the man of her dreams. One, this thought proved to be prophetic. A few minutes later, she noticed a very attractive young man intently looking at her and smiling. He waved at her, and she waved back. Then the young man approached her and introduced himself. He was John Bobbitt, and he could not take his eyes off the young beauty with the quite exotic appearance. The guy was handsome, tall and charismatic. He cracked jokes and skillfully paid compliments, so she couldn't resist his charm. They spent the evening dancing and chatting, and afterwards, the new acquaintance walked Lorena to her aunt's home. As they said goodbye, he asked for her home phone number and promised to call soon. John Wayne Bobbitt was born on March 24, 1967, in Buffalo, in the northwestern part of New York State. He was the youngest of three children in his family, at the age of three, the boy lost his father, who tragically died, and his mother, unable to cope with the shock, ended up in a psychiatric clinic after a serious nervous breakdown. All three children were taken into the care of their religious aunt and uncle, who wanted to help their relatives in this difficult situation. The boy was still very young at the time, but the events that occurred undoubtedly left a mark on his life. The aunt and uncle raised the children with strictness in accordance with religious canons. They all attended church every Sunday and engaged in charity work, 
trying to help those around them. John was not an outstanding student, but overall, he did fairly well in school. As a teenager, he decided to pursue a future in military service. After undergoing the necessary training and special preparation at a military academy, the young man joined the ranks of the Marines, where he proved himself as a brave, disciplined, and determined young man. However, after a few years, the strict regime and the need to obey in the army began to weigh on him. After leaving the service with some military experience and skills, he was hired as a security guard at one of the city's popular establishments, but he later changed jobs frequently, not staying long at any. The day after they met, John, as promised, called Lorena to ask her out on a date. The young couple simply walked through the park, engaging in easy conversation about various topics, and John made it clear that he wanted to continue their relationship. Lorena was not opposed to this, but according to the rules set by her aunt, she had to introduce her boyfriend to her before they could start a serious relationship. John accepted all the conditions, and on the appointed day, he came to dinner at the home of his beloved's relative. Bobbitt was very sweet, courteous, and considerate. Yet he made an effort to appear serious. He managed to make a good impression on the strict Janna, and after a serious one-on-one -on -one conversation with the young man, the woman allowed her niece to continue seeing John. Six months after the start of their romantic relationship, the suitor proposed to Lorena, and she accepted. She was overjoyed, having always dreamed of a family, children, and a home of her own. The couple began preparing for the most important event of their lives, and in June 1989, shortly after Gallo turned 19, they made their union official. The wedding celebration was quite modest, as the young couple did not have the money for a lavish ceremony, and they chose to spend their savings on a honeymoon by the warm ocean coast. They were happy, but the only shadow over the celebration was the absence of the bride and groom's parents. Instead, their aunts and uncles came to share the joyous moment with them. After the wedding and a delightful honeymoon, the couple moved to Virginia and settled in a quiet and cozy area of the city called Manassas. The first few months of their life together were like a real fairy tale. They enjoyed each other's company, showing mutual tenderness, care, and love. But as the new year of 1990 approached, the situation began to change for the worse. At first, Lorena tried not to pay much attention to some of her young husband's remarks and rudeness, thinking it was just a so-called adjustment period. But one day, when she served cooled soup for dinner, her husband simply threw the plate on the floor and then started yelling at his wife, insulting her and calling her a terrible homemaker. She tried to argue, pointing out that John Wang, he closely monitored where she went and who she spoke to. At home, she had to follow the rules he set, and intimacy between them occurred only when John wanted it, regardless of Lena's wishes. The poor girl couldn't share her problems with anyone as she found the situation shameful and humiliating. On June 22, 1993, John, along with his longtime military buddy, decided to go out to an entertainment venue. The men partied and drank until late at night, while Lorena was at home alone. She did not wait up for her husband and went to the bedroom around midnight, soon falling asleep. Around three in the morning, a drunk and aroused John returned home. He didn't waste any time and ripped the shirt off his sleeping wife. Lorena hardly understood what was happening when her husband forcefully took advantage of her. She begged him to stop and not to do this, crying, but he was completely indifferent to her pleas and tears. After it was over, John simply collapsed next to her and fell asleep. Lorena, trembling and sobbing, made her way to the kitchen. She poured herself some water and took a few sips to calm down, but then her gaze fell on a stand with large, sharp kitchen knives. Her hand reached out on its own and pulled out a carving knife. Out of her mind, she went back to the bedroom where her husband lay on his back, snoring drunkenly. She grabbed his genitalia with her left hand, squeezed hard, and sharply cut through with the knife, severing a large part of it. John jumped up, screaming in agony, while Lorena simply walked out of the room, went to the garage, and got into her car, 
speeding away through the deserted nighttime streets of the city. She only came to her senses at an intersection when she saw a red light at the traffic signal. At that moment, she looked at her blood-stained hands and realized that she was still holding the severed part of John's body in her left hand. She rolled down the window and threw the detested piece of flesh out, then continued driving. Lorena headed to the home of a close friend who was stunned by her nighttime visit and the state she was in. After Lorena told her what had happened, her friend, realizing the gravity of the situation, called the police herself and summoned a medical team to the house where the injured Bobbit was. Precision surgery was required. Throughout this ordeal, John was desperately trying to stop the bleeding by pressing a sheet against his wound. Notably, the groin vein is a major vessel, and its injury nearly always results in death from blood loss. However, John was somewhat fortunate, if one could say that, because a clot had formed, significantly slowing the blood loss. The responding medics arrived in time to transport him to the nearest hospital, where he received immediate medical attention. The question then arose about the whereabouts of the severed part of his genitalia, as it was still possible to reattach it to its original place with restoration of its initial physiological functions. Lorena indicated the approximate area of the road where she had discarded her husband's anatomical fragment, and after an extensive search, the police were able to find it. The amputated organ was cleansed with antiseptic, then placed in a special container with medical ice and urgently transported to the hospital where the injured party was already being treated. The surgeon who arrived from the state capital was astounded by the complexity of the situation, as he had never encountered such a case before. But he proceeded with the operation anyway. He performed a unique surgery for that time, which lasted more than nine hours and was more than successful. Despite the traumatic amputation of the organ and the fact that it had lain on the road for over an hour, all tissues and vessels were successfully reattached and the patient quickly began to recover. Public outcry ensued. That same night, Lorena was arrested and taken to the police station for questioning, as well as to clarify all the circumstances and motives of her actions. She immediately confessed to everything and shared her harrowing story that had driven her to such a desperate act. She recounted how four years of marriage had turned into a real nightmare for her, with her husband regularly abusing her, both emotionally and physically, and forcing intimacy only when he desired. Mrs. Bobbitt also mentioned how, about a year ago, her husband had forced her to terminate a pregnancy, despite her deep desire to have a child, and that abortion had been a traumatizing event for her Regarding the incident itself, she said she remembered very little of that night and had acted as if she were in a fog. Lorena recounted how her husband had come home drunk and simply taken advantage of her, and although she tried to resist, he ignored her. After the incident, she went to the kitchen for water, and the next thing she remembered was her husband's scream, the roar of the car engine, and the part of his genitalia that she was clutching in her hand as she sat behind the wheel. The case caused a significant stir in the press and was actively covered by the media. Many women like Lorena, who had suffered from domestic violence, as well as feminist organizations, which were gaining strength and popularity at the time, rallied to her side. In the early 90s, wives who were subjected to emotional and physical abuse by their husbands typically remained silent about their plight. Society was still inclined to blame the victims themselves, suggesting that they provoked conflicts or behaved improperly. It was assumed that a wife should be submissive and obey her husband in everything, and if the husband was dissatisfied and resorted to violence, it was considered the wife's fault. It was her fault. Intimacy in marriage was considered a duty of the wife, not open to discussion. On the other hand, almost all men sided with John, Many feared that Lorena's act might prove contagious, prompting other women suffering from physical and intimate violence in marriage to also take up knives. According to official statistics, there were several million such women in the country at that time. Trials and sentences of the spouses 
Two parallel court cases began almost simultaneously. Lorena officially charged her husband only with taking advantage of her on that fateful night. Although in court she detailed the years of regular abuse and beatings, emotional violence and humiliations she endured, as well as the abortion she was forced to undergo against her will under her husband's coercion. John's testimony was confused. He denied all allegations against him, but much of what Lorena said was corroborated by facts. For instance, it was confirmed that he did not have steady employment or a stable source of income, yet he loved spending time in entertainment venues, often forcibly or deceitfully taking money from his wife to do so. Additionally, Lorena's friends confirmed that they had repeatedly seen bruises and scrapes on her body, and she had been in a depressed state for a long time, though she tried not to complain. The court concluded that the husband had indeed abused his wife both emotionally and physically throughout their marriage, driving her to desperation. However, regarding the charge of intimate violence that occurred on the night of June 23, 1993, there was not enough evidence, and thus John was acquitted. He presented several versions of what happened that evening, and the jury, composed of nine women and three men, found him not guilty. In the fall of that year, Lorena's trial began in September 1993. She was charged with inflicting severe bodily harm on her spouse. Her lawyers argued that she acted while suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, caused by the ongoing emotional and physical abuse from her husband. A psychiatric evaluation was ordered, which confirmed that she acted in a state of distress, unaware of her actions, and therefore could not be held responsible for what she had done. In early January of the following year, after nearly eight hours of deliberation, the jury decided that Lorena could not be held criminally responsible for her actions, as she was in a state of insanity at the time of the offense. However, she was required to undergo a six-week treatment program at a specialized clinic, after which she was able to return to her previous life. The spouses officially divorced only in 1995, after which Lorena reverted to her maiden name. What became of John later? John remained indignant for a long time that his wife faced no punishment for her actions. He decided to fully capitalize on his sudden notoriety, aiming to extract as much money as possible from such scandalous fame. John founded his own music band called Severed Parts, but the group was short-lived as it failed to garner any public interest. When offered a substantial fee to star in adult films in the late 90s, he did not hesitate to accept. Thus, he appeared in explicit films titled Franken Penis, a play on Frankenstein, and John Wayne Bobbitt Uncut. John acted in several more films of a similar genre, but interest in him and his reattached organ quickly waned. For a long time, John was eager to appear on various talk shows and gave interviews extensively, but over the years, such offers became less frequent, and the story gradually faded from memory. John then found work as a bartender in an entertainment venue in Las Vegas, and by his 50s, he was struggling to make ends meet by taking jobs as a mover, driver, and pizza delivery man. In 1999, he received a suspended sentence for theft. Regarding his personal life, during the high-profile court case that the entire country followed, journalists discovered that Bobbitt had an illegitimate son named Andrew, born in 1992 to one of his lovers, Beatrice Williams. In 1994, John was brought to trial for assaulting his new girlfriend, Christina Elliott, who worked as a dancer in a nightclub. He spent 15 days in jail for this and received probation. In the early 2000s, John was arrested three times for assaulting his then-wife, Joanna Farrell. This time, he was imprisoned for a year for violating his probation. They officially divorced in 2004. What happened to Lorena? Unlike her former husband, Lorena did not take pride in her scandalous notoriety and tried to stay out of the limelight. In 1996, she decided to return to her native Ecuador, where her mother, Elia, was living at the time. However, just six months later, Lorena made the news again when her mother accused her of assault. The conflict was resolved without going to court, and the women continued to live together. A year later, Lorena returned to the USA, 
where she opened her own small beauty salon in Washington. In 2007, she founded a foundation called Lena's Red Wagon, which focused on helping women who had suffered from domestic violence. Soon after, Lorena agreed to give an interview for the first time in a long time and appeared on CBS News Morning Show, where she discussed her life post-incident. She also appeared on the popular Oprah Winfrey talk show in the mid-2000s. Lorena remarried, and her new husband was a man named Dave Bellinger, with whom she had a daughter in 2006. She preferred not to recall her marriage to Bob at all and claimed she did not follow his life after their divorce. In 2009, nearly 15 years after their sensational legal battles had ended, the former spouses met face to face for the first time on the show Insider. John apologized to Lorena for the way he had treated her during their marriage and declared that he still loved her despite everything. Lorena was visibly moved by his words and confirmed that every year on Valentine's Day, her ex-husband still sends her flowers and cards. Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Samantha Koenig. On the 1st of February 2012, in Anchorage, Alaska, 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was working late and alone at a coffee stand called Common Grounds. It was about 8 p.m. when the last customer of the night approached the stand. Samantha greeted them and took their order. CCTV footage shows the view from behind the counter. Samantha can be seen doing her job, prepping the customer's order, and nothing seems out of the ordinary until Samantha hands the customer their order. Now, Samantha had only been employed at the coffee stand for about a month, obviously still getting used to the new job. She was completely unaware of the terror that was about to pounce directly onto her innocent life. Samantha returned to the window and handed the unseen customer their order. Suddenly, the 18-year-old girl took a step back from the window and raised her hands. It's quite clear from the footage that she was startled, but unfortunately, the CCTV didn't capture what caused Samantha's flight response to activate. It was pretty obvious that there was a gun pointed directly at Samantha's face. The gunman demanded money. It also seemed clear via the footage that Samantha had been given instructions to turn off the lights in the coffee stand, which she obeyed with no resistance. Once it was dark inside Common Grounds, the gunman quickly slipped in through the window of the coffee stand. He then forced Samantha down to her knees and restrained her with zip ties. He asked her where her car was. She told him she didn't have one. She also reportedly said that her dad would be there to pick her up at any minute. The ski mask wearing armed assailant hesitated. Then he proceeded to force the young girl out of common grounds and head towards Tudor Road. But Samantha Koenig saw an opportunity and she took it. She tore herself away from her captor's grip and ran as fast as she could, but she wasn't quick enough to outrun him. After a chase that lasted little more than a few yards, the man tackled Samantha to the ground. He told her that if she didn't cooperate, he would kill her and no one would hear a thing because the ammo was silenced. Terrified and frightened, young Samantha was out of options. She had no choice but to do what the man said. With an arm around her and his other hand gripping the gun that was pressed against her body, the 18-year-old hostage and the masked man walked across the road into a parking lot between IHOP and Dairy Queen. It was there that the masked man had parked his white truck. He'd been careful enough to prepare for the abduction by taking off the truck's toolboxes and the license plates. A few minutes later, the truck drove away with Samantha Koenig bound in the passenger seat. The truck was driven around town while the driver told Samantha that she'd only been kidnapped for ransom. She pleaded with him and said her family didn't have much money, but the man in the mask wasn't deterred. He assured the scared young girl that her family would seek the help of the public for the funds, and he convinced her that if she cooperated, eventually she would be reunited with her family in good time. Samantha believed what the stranger said as she continued to try and convince him to let her go, but he was determined to secure the money. 
During the drive, the man realized Samantha had left her phone at the Common Grounds coffee stand. It being a major key part of his plan, he decided to go back and retrieve it, leaving Samantha still bound in the truck. Samantha's abductor then sent two messages from her phone, one to Samantha's boyfriend and the other one to the owner of the coffee stand. The texts made it appear as though Samantha was having a bad day and just needed to escape for the weekend. But by all accounts, those messages weren't fooling anyone. It was totally unlike Samantha to do something like that, and something most certainly wasn't right. But the truth was in the lie. She was certainly having a bad day, and she desperately needed to escape. As if his actions weren't bold enough in the midst of a public kidnapping, the masked man made Samantha tell him where she lived. He wanted her bank card, but she explained that she shared an account with her boyfriend and that the card was still in his truck. So the man drove to their house with Samantha still bound in the truck and broke into their vehicle to steal the ATM card. It was around 3 a.m. when Samantha's boyfriend noticed a masked man standing near his vehicle. He confronted the individual before rushing back inside to seek the assistance of Samantha's father. However, by the time they emerged from the house, the man had vanished, along with the debit card shared by Samantha and her boyfriend. Anchorage, Alaska was left in shock. Samantha Koenig, known by everyone as a caring and selfless person, did not deserve to be held hostage. The entire situation was incredibly heartbreaking and the news spread quickly in the cold air. James Koenig, Samantha's father, decided to make a public appeal for the safe return of his 18-year-old daughter. Posters with the message, please help find my daughter, were put up everywhere and the community rallied to help. James expressed his concerns saying, I don't know if my daughter is being fed, taken care of, if she's still alive or if she's getting any sleep. Despite a reward of $41,000 being offered for information leading to Samantha's return or whereabouts, no one had any answers. As the days passed by like melting wax from a burning candle, the concerns for Samantha's well-being intensified and a grim sense of fear gripped the local community. The FBI and local law enforcement began questioning Samantha's family members and close friends, hoping to uncover a clue or lead. However, everyone, including her boyfriend, was ruled out. The investigators admitted that they had nothing and that the truth about what happened to Samantha Koenig and the identity of the masked man was not even on our radar. Three weeks of silence and minimal leads later, Samantha's boyfriend received a text from her phone that read, Connor Park, sign under pick of Albert, ain't she purdy? Samantha's loved ones rushed to Connor Park, praying that the clue would lead to good news, or perhaps even Samantha's safe return. However, the truth they would discover in the park was completely unexpected. Someone spotted a picture on the park bulletin board, a memorial picture of a deceased dog that read, thanks for all the fun, Albert the Golden Doodle. Directly under Albert's picture was a Ziploc bag waiting to be opened. Inside the bag was a letter demanding $30,000 to be deposited into Samantha's account if they ever wanted to see her alive again. The bag also contained a photograph of Samantha being held hostage, staring directly at the camera while an unknown arm held up a copy of a recent newspaper. It was a glimmer of hope, but it was just the beginning. Following the instructions, $5,000 of community donated funds were deposited into Samantha's account. A few hours later, someone withdrew that money using Samantha's debit card. Anchorage ATM footage captured a man with his face covered, wearing gloves and dark clothes, but nothing identifiable. Investigators quickly raced to the ATM, but arrived to find nothing of use. The trail went cold right there in the tracks of Samantha's captor, who had long gone with the money and the life of an 18-year-old hostage in his grip. A week later, the man made another withdrawal from an ATM in Wilcox, Arizona, almost 4,000 miles away. Subsequent withdrawals were made in Lordsburg, New Mexico, Humble, Texas, and Shepherd, Texas. Samantha's kidnapper was heading east across the I-10, but he had made a critical mistake. During the withdrawal in Wilcox, Arizona, ATM footage captured his white Ford Focus in the background. 
Now investigators had something that just might lead them to Samantha before it was too late. The photo of the white Ford Focus was swiftly distributed to authorities everywhere. On March 13, 2012, a state trooper noticed a vehicle matching the description of the wanted car in a hotel parking lot in Texas. The officer watched a man get into the car and begin to drive away. The trooper followed the Ford Focus closely behind and pulled the car over the moment it exceeded the speed limit. When asked for identification, the driver presented a driver's license for a man named Israel Keys. Israel Keys was the name of the man who was not even on our radar. Upon searching the car, they discovered Samantha's ID, her debit card, her cell phone, a gun, and the disguise he wore in the ATM footage. It was evident that they had found their man, but the question remained, where was Samantha? Two weeks later, Israel was sent back to Anchorage, Alaska. The FBI investigator who dealt with Israel described their interactions, saying that sometimes communicating with him was like talking to a neighbor, while at other times, his voice made the hair on the back of their neck stand up. I almost feel guilty wasting a lot of the taxpayer's money, but that's how committed I am, you know? Well, it sounds like they've got it under control. Israel Keyes was a 34-year-old, unassuming man with no criminal record and a well-known construction business. He also lived with his girlfriend and 10-year-old daughter. He was known around the town as a family man, a good friend, and someone you'd have no problem trusting with the key to your own house. As a matter of fact, someone from the U.S. Attorney's Office even used Israel Keyes as a handyman. By all accounts, Israel Keyes was a well-respected, good citizen of the local community. His neighbors said that there was nothing suspicious about him at all. But Israel Keyes was leading two completely different lives. It wasn't long into his interrogation that Keyes admitted to killing Samantha Koenig. The night he kidnapped her, he took her home and chained her up in the shed next to the house where his girlfriend and young daughter slept totally oblivious to the monster that lurked around them. Israel turned on the stereo and cranked up the volume to drown out Samantha's screams. It's reported that Keyes sipped wine as he described to a terrified Samantha just what exactly he was going to do to her. Then he sexually assaulted her and reportedly strangled her to death during the assault. The confession of the murder of Samantha Koenig was never released publicly. But one of the investigators that was present during the confession stated that Keyes described what happened in that shed as if he was reciting what he had for dinner. Hours after raping and killing Samantha, Keyes and his family left Anchorage, Alaska to go on a cruise from New Orleans. He wouldn't return home for over two weeks, leaving Samantha's body frozen and hidden in a dark shed in Alaska. When he finally came home, he took Samantha's body out sexually violated her frozen corpse and posed her up for the ransom photo that was found in the bag at Connor Park. Yes, Samantha had already been dead for two weeks when the ransom photo was taken. He held her eyes open with fishing line. Ain't she purdy now? Took on a much more sinister meaning. Israel had been gloating. It was like an inside joke for himself, but still, no one knew the horror that brewed beneath the surface of the sick double life of Israel Keys. There's no one who knows me, or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really," Kais told investigators during his interviews. Israel Kais, a former specialist in the U.S. Army, was born in Utah. He stated in interviews that he couldn't wait to get out of the Army so he could start killing people. His hero was Ted Bundy. After the ransom photo, Keyes cut up and dismembered Samantha Koenig's body. Keyes is believed to have at least 12 victims to date, but the feds believe he may have victims all across the USA. Keyes told investigators that he would tell them every gory detail as long as they promised him that he would get the death penalty for his crimes. And he granted around two dozen interviews within the seven months that authorities had him detained. A chilling detail about Keyes's criminal methods is that he would travel to different places all around the country and bury something he liked to call a kill kit. When the urge to slaughter someone struck, he could hop on a plane, rent a car, dig up his kill cache, 
and then butcher the first person he got the opportunity to catch. He would literally pick a state that hid one of his murder boxes and go kill anyone he could, as long as he could get away with it. Authorities have found and recovered two of his kill caches, one in Alaska and one in New York. They contained money, weapons, and items like Drano used for dissolving bodies. Keyes indicated that there were other supply boxes buried across the country. He would even travel to a place where he'd like to kill in the future and bury a kill cache. In another twist, Israel Keyes funded his entire murder career via money he got from bank robberies. It's more than likely that Keyes did not know any of his victims prior to their abductions. He preferred remote locations like parks, campgrounds, trailheads, cemeteries, boating areas, or anywhere else he could kill and get away with it. No one knows exactly when or who Keyes' first victim was, but the disappearance of a 12-year-old disabled girl named Julie Marie Harris on March 3rd of 1996 might have been Israel Keyes' victim zero. Julie, a Special Olympics athlete with prosthetic feet, disappeared while waiting on a ride to church after running away from her home following an argument with her mother. Israel Keyes would have been 18 years old and living in the area at the time of Julie's disappearance. Her prosthetic feet were found at the mouth of the Colville River a year later, and her skeleton was recovered. When questioned, Israel claimed he was aware of the Julie Marie Harris case, but had nothing to do with it. Apparently, the birth of his daughter convinced him to never harm children, but Julie would have disappeared way before his daughter came along. Also, one of Julie's friends claims to remember Keyes talking to Julie at a local swimming pool where she often swam. Word has it, Julie even gave the serial killer her home address and phone number. But Keyes claimed his first attempted murder was a girl he kidnapped and sexually assaulted in 97 or 98 near Bend, Oregon. Keyes claimed he was convinced that he screwed up that time because he let the victim go, and from that moment on, he vowed never to let them live. It was shortly after that when Keyes joined the army, where he excelled as a model soldier. After a three-year stint in the US Army, he quickly started killing in Washington state. Investigators believe Lake Crescent in Washington may be a liquid grave to a few of Israel's victims, but ultimately, no one has all the information because before Keyes could tell his full story and bring closure to so many cold cases, he was found dead in his cell. He had slashed open his veins, hung himself, and stuffed toilet paper down his throat. He never even stood trial, and so many dark secrets were buried with him. Secrets no one else may ever know. He left behind a suicide note that was a macabre rant, but it was of little help. A few months before his suicide, Keyes drew 11 skulls on sheets of paper and one pentagram with a goat in the middle of it. One of the skull drawings had the words, we are one, written on it. No one knows what they mean, but it was pretty obvious that the drawings were done in Keyes' own blood. They were found under his bed in his jail cell. It's thought that these drawings represent Keyes' victims. The FBI has only ever identified five of them. Innocent young Samantha Koenig was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and a beautiful young life was stolen, while so many others were ruined. But thanks to her, the world is a little bit safer. Never take your surroundings for granted. Never trust strange eyes on your back that you cannot observe. Always trust your instincts, because in one swift moment, reality can shift and your life can drain away. Always do your best to make sure your family never has to go on the news to appeal for your safe return. Remember Samantha Koenig, watch your own back and always, always, always lock your door. This case is not over. The FBI also released a list of 35 trips serial killer Israel Keyes made around the USA, Mexico and Canada over the last eight years of his life. The public is asked to immediately report to authorities if they ever stumble upon one of Israel's kill caches and do not disturb anything they may find, as the investigation into the serial murders committed by Israel Keyes remains ongoing. The FBI is still seeking the public's assistance with any information about Keyes' travels in order to identify additional victims. They ask that anyone with information contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. Israel Keyes had no remorse at all. 
He enjoyed what he did. He talked about enjoying what he did. He talked about, had he not been caught, some of his future plans and what he would have done, which included continuing to do what he was doing, continuing to kidnap and murder people. So he had no remorse at all. All of the people shuffling into your house there, looking brave in front of you, can go lost. Everyone knows. So they say, one by one, we fall on my own before. Save it for love papers. They don't need to know a single thing about or will you? Yes, you can take it all with you now. Oh, my life before. One by one, word for one, my one before, go loves. All of the people shuffle to your house. God alone, everyone knows, one by one we fall. One by one we fall. One by one with four, one by one, we food foreign.